Okay, in this video, we're gonna look at some examples of quotient rings and ideals and ring homomorphisms and stuff like that. So the first thing that we wanna look at is this example. So let's say R is equal to upper triangular two by two matrices. So th those are of the form A, B, zero, C, where um, A, B, and C are in real numbers, okay? So maybe the first thing we want to show is that this is a ring, but we know that this is a subset of um, maybe M two by two R. So that ring of two by two matrices. So all that we really need to show is that is a sub ring. In other words, it's closed under subtraction and multiplication, but that's really easy to do. Notice that A, B, zero, C minus X, Y, uh, zero, Z is equal to A minus X, um, B minus Y, zero, C minus Z, which that is clearly still upper triangular. And then for the multiplication, if we have a, b, zero, c times x, y, zero, z, and we multiply those guys, we're going to get uh, a, x in this upper left, and then let's see, a, uh, y plus b, z right there, and then zero, c, z right there, and that's clearly still upper triangular. So what that tells us is that yes, this is a ring. Sorry, I should maybe say subring of uh, that guy right there, but it being a subring means it is a ring in its own right. So the next thing that I want to do is consider an ideal of this ring R, and then first of all, we'll show that it's an ideal and then look at the quotient ring. Um, so I'll erase this little calculation so that we can do that. So the ideal that we're interested in looking at is this one given by 0x00. In other words, it's just this matrix way up here um, with the entry way up in the right-hand side. And we want to show, first of all, that this is an ideal and then find it, uh, what the quotient ring is. So the way that we'll show it's an ideal is um, by first showing that it's a subring. But again, in order to be a subring of R, it needs to be closed under subtraction and multiplication by the subring test. So let's go ahead and do 0x00 minus 0y00, but that's clearly 0x minus y00, which is an element of I. And then furthermore, 0x00, 0y00 is going to be equal to 0, um, zero, 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 which is in I. So in fact, guys like this are zero divisors, so that's kind of interesting. Um, now let's go ahead and see that it's an ideal. So in order for it to be an ideal, we need this property. We need, um, for all I and I and R and R, we have this uh, right absorption and this left absorption. So I times R is in I, and R times I is also in I. So uh, let's go ahead and take an arbitrary element from the ideal and an arbitrary element from the ring, and let's see what happens when we multiply them in both orders. So let's do 0x00 zero 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 times AB0C, zero and notice that matrix multiplication gives us the following. So we'll have zero in this first component, we will have x times c in this second component, and then we'll have zero in these two bottom components. So that's still an element from i. Okay, good. So now let's go ahead and do the multiplication in the other order. So a, b, zero, c times zero, uh, x, zero, zero. Notice that is going to give us um, zero, AX00, zero, zero, which is still an element from I. So that tells us that this thing is indeed an ideal. Now, I'm going to erase the board, and we're actually going to look at a different proof that this is an ideal, um, just kind of for interest. So we're going to do another proof that this is an ideal, and that is we're going to consider this map phi from our ring R of upper triangular matrices to 
R cross R, and by R cross R, I mean real numbers cross real numbers, where the multiplication and addition are given component-wise. So let's just recall, this is uh, X comma Y, such that X and Y are real numbers. And then you add and multiply component-wise. Let's define this map in the following way. We'll take phi of our upper triangular matrix, A, B, 0, C, and send it to the ordered pair AC. So notice that's going to be an R cross R. Now we need to check that this uh, satisfies the additive property and the multiplicative property for homomorphisms. So let's do the additive property first. So we'll do phi of a, B, 0, C plus um, X, Y, 0, Z. So there we're adding two things inside the ring R. Notice that's going to give us phi of um, A plus X, uh, B plus Y, 0, C plus Z. But that gives us uh, the ordered pair A plus X, C plus Z, like that. But now that's uh, very, very clearly equal to phi of a, B, 0, C plus phi of X, Y, 0, Z, which is what we need. Now let's look at the multiplicative property to see if that works. So notice that phi of A, B, 0, C times X, Y, uh, 0, Z. So if we do that multiplication of matrices, we're going to get this. So uh, here we'll get A, X in the upper left component. Here we'll get AY plus BZ, so sorry, AY plus BZ in that upper right component. Then we get a zero down here, and then we get a CZ in this a lower right component. But notice our homomorphism throws this bit away, and this just gives us um, AXCZ. But like I said before, uh, multiplication in R cross R is given component-wise. So this is exactly equal to um, A, uh, C times X, Z. But that's equal to phi of A, B, 0, C times phi of X, Y, 0, Z. So we've got the additive property and the multiplicative property. So that makes this thing a homomorphism of rings, I should say. Okay, I'll clean up the board and then, well, we'll see how this tells us that this thing is an ideal. So now that we know this thing is a homomorphism, let's go ahead and find its kernel. So let's uh, suppose that um, A, B, 0, C is inside the kernel of phi. So what that tells us is that phi of A, B, 0, C equals 0, 0. Remember, it's got to be the 0 element in the codomain, which is R cross R. But on the other hand, we know what this does. This sends it to A comma C. But what that tells us is that A and C um, are equal to 0 and 0. In other words, A is equal to 0 and C is equal to 0. But what that tells us is that this original matrix, A, B, 0, C, was really of the form 0, B, 0, C, 0, 0, which is an element from the ideal. So uh, what we have here is that the kernel of phi um, is equal to this ideal. Well, really, we just showed containment in one direction, but containment in the other direction is pretty easy. But then we know that the kernel is always an ideal, so this is actually an alternative proof to show that uh, this I is an ideal because it's the kernel of a homomorphism. This is a really important strategy for proving something's an ideal or a normal subgroup or whatever. Instead of doing it directly, you just find a homomorphism for which whatever you're trying to prove is an ideal or a normal subgroup is the kernel. So now that we have that, I want to notice another thing, and not only is this a homomorphism, but it is very clearly a surjective homomorphism. Notice that anything inside of R cross R can be written as um, A times C, where those are free, and then obviously we can find a pre-image here. So uh, notice that that allows us to finish this thing off very quickly and say that 
R mod I, which notice that's the same thing as R mod the kernel of phi, is isomorphic to the image of phi, but since phi is surjective, that is equal to R cross R. And here I've used the first isomorphism theorem for rings in order to do that. Okay, good. So I'm going to clean up the board and then we're going to look at another example. Okay, for our next example, we want to consider the Gaussian integers. So those are all numbers of the form a plus bi, where a and b are integers. And then we have three times the Gaussian integers. So this is really the principal ideal inside of the Gaussian integers uh, generated by the three. So we know this is an ideal immediately. And our goal is to show that this ideal is maximal. Now maybe the first thing that I want to notice is the following. If we take a z mod, sorry, z adjoin i mod this ideal generated by three, then um, that's kind of clearly isomorphic to z3 adjoin i. And I guess uh, we can do a little proof of this. So the proof will go as follows. Let's uh, take phi from z adjoin i to z3 i. And what we will do is we'll take a plus b i here and we will send it to a plus uh, b i and maybe we'll put the equivalence class over here. So really what I mean by this is this is the equivalence class of a mod 3 plus the equivalence class of B mod 3 I. So uh, this is very clearly a homomorphism. I'll let you guys check that, but it all kind of follows from the fact that um, the map from Z to Zn uh, given in a very similar way as a homomorphism. So uh, also it's clearly on to. So let's just go ahead and look at the kernel. So let's say A plus B I is in the kernel of phi. So notice that means that phi of a plus b i is equal to zero inside of this ring. But what that tells us is that the equivalence class of a mod 3 plus the equivalence class of b mod 3 i is equal to zero. But what that tells us is that a is congruent to zero mod 3 and b is congruent to zero mod 3. Great. But finally, that tells us that um, a equals 3m for some integer m, and b um, equals 3n for some integer n. But that's exactly what it takes for a plus bi to be inside of 3z uh, adjoint i. In other words, the principal ideal generated by 3. So what we have is the kernel of phi is contained inside of the principal ideal generated by 3. And then very similarly, you can prove the, the opposite containment. In other words, this kernel is equal to that principal ideal, which by the first isomorphism theorem for rings establishes um, this isomorphism. Okay, great. Now our next goal is to show that this is a maximal ideal, and the way we will do that is by showing that this quotient is actually a field. Okay, so I'll clean up the board and then we'll do that. So uh, just to reiterate where we are, we know that this ideal 3 uh, times zi is the same thing as the principal ideal generated by 3. And then by this result over here, which we have on a previous video, this is a maximal ideal if and only if z3 adjoin i is a field. So uh, notice that uh, z3 adjoin i has exactly uh, nine elements. And so those elements are 0, 1, 2, um, 0, 1, and 2, and then we're, we're going to have um, i and 2i, 1 plus i, 1 plus 2i, and then finally 2 plus i, 2 plus 2i. So let's make sure that's everything. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And how do we know um, that's all we have? Well, you can think about this as being um, a choice for the real part and a choice for the imaginary part. And we've got three choices for each. Three times three is nine. And now in order for this to be a field, each element needs to have an inverse. And showing that everything has an inverse, it's really just kind of a, a game, multiplying things together until you find out that they uh, multiply to give you one. So notice that two, 
times two is equal to four, but four is equal to one in Z3, so that means two is its own inverse. And then also, I times two I, so that's going to give us negative two, but negative two is equal to one um, in Z3 also, so that means I and two I are also their own inverses, sorry, are inverses of each other. And now we can just uh, play the game with all the rest of them. So notice we've taken care of all of these. We don't need to take care of that one because a zero element can't have an inverse. So now notice if we do one plus i and then maybe two plus i. So if we FOIL this thing out, we're going to get a two plus a two i plus another i, so those are the cross terms, and then minus one, but notice that simplifies all the way down to one, because we know that two i plus i is equal to three i, but three is equal to zero. And then we have two minus one is one, so that means uh, one plus i and two plus i are inverses of each other. So here we have one plus i, uh, two plus i are inverses of each other. Now let's check the last one. So one plus uh, two i times two plus two i. Okay, so let's multiply this out. So notice we're going to get one times two, which is two, and then we'll have two i times two, so that's four i, two i times one, so that's two i. And then 2i times 2i is negative 4, so notice 4 plus 2 is 6, so that makes this whole thing 0. And then 2 minus 4 is negative 2, which is 1 in Z3, so that means those guys are inverses of each other. So in other words, we've shown that every non-zero element has an inverse, um, which means that this thing is a field which tells us that this ideal is maximal. Now notice this is a hacked, to, hacked together way to do this, and in fact there's a much better way to do this in general if you have kind of arbitrary numbers, um, but I mean this is a good practice to do at the beginning. All right, we're done.